Here before. That's a private joke. I've been doing this since 1991. I got one laugh, that's all I need. Two, three headphones. Uh, thank you for that. Let me just uh, call up my little notes here, not that I really need them. Um, this is pretty good. We're only missing uh, one person here, so I'm just going to put in the whole I don't know how it happened. I'm sure. I don't know how it happened. Because I love it so. We can take that. Yeah, I could do this. All right. Thank you. So you are. You are. I'm sorry. So the Christian. Yeah, my back. My pleasure. My pleasure. Research one right down the So the college research was always our thing. We're seeing. And then we'd see patients come out with all kinds of debilitating conditions that were symptomatic. Okay. Okay. Um, survey, how many people can raise their right hand? About half, that's pretty good. Um, you, those of you who have been to my panels before know that my goal is to get to conversation as quickly as possible so that everybody gets value, <coughs> including my panelists who have come from far, wide, and actually not narrow, because everybody here has deep vertical expertise. Um, I'll introduce myself first, simply because I'm a mental health educator and a deep narcissist. So it's really important for me to see who in the audience even knows what narcissism is and where it comes from. That's the challenging part. Childhood, I got a good read on that one. So I'm a mental health and economic development educator through entertainment and technology, which is a natural segue to cannabis, of course. Um, I actually, I'm, it's not that far off. I produce movies, games, I've helped start a bunch of companies. My first company was doing something called Windows in 1984-85. We were the first company bought by Microsoft. And um, my most recent big movie was Steve Jobs. My most recent not so famous movie was Laborshnik. They said we had a branding issue, I didn't buy it. Um, God, this is a good crowd tonight. I'm gonna go really fast though. Uh, I'm also a hypochondriac. So this panel is important to me, very important to me. Um, I work pretty closely with Victor, uh, you know, modestly. I mean, Victor thinks all this stuff. I helped him pivot into cannabis just a little bit. I didn't help him pivot, but I helped populate the board. Not the board, but these, these panels. And I have two panels that I'm doing this time. Uh, I do them both yearly. One is matching strains to maladies. Uh, and to my shock, on the very first panel, uh, I had uh, uh, the doctor who, in, who got the first patent ever I'm using cannabis for epilepsy. And she, like a Monty Python movie, said, well, actually, you can't do that. You can't match maladies to strains, but we'll get back to that later. And my other panel is, what are the pains and challenges that the wellness industry is uh, dealing with as we begin to slowly but surely upscale or up res these CBD, CBG, the CBGBs. I'm sorry, that was my own invention. Um, as parents until they see the beautiful results this brings on their children and themselves. That was pretty funny actually. I would laugh myself if I wasn't professional. Anyway, um, we have a great audience here and um, uh, I am actually in this business thanks to Tim Blake, uh, who in 1986, uh, he and a couple of his associates, they were quietly the biggest or amongst the biggest growers in uh, Northern California, but they all had children. They couldn't believe the dreck that was out there for video, so they banded together and put their own video company together, started producing educational videos that all the major VCs started buying for their kids. They found me because I was doing something called digital media in 1985, 86, 1993, not 203, had a little party in his house, invited me to come, and uh, there were 100 people there. Uh, last year, there were 25,000. But that's just the Tim story, that's the Emerald Cup. Everybody on the panel right here is massively accomplished, massively esteemed, except myself, of course, because I'm massively humble, not in the cannabis space. I do have a couple startups in the space, but I'm gonna dive right in. So uh, I uh, really started thinking a lot about, well, what can we talk about that gets right to the point when you start talking about cannabis relative to the mainstream markets? Now, remember this is a couple years ago, so I'm thinking about myself. I got into the industry in a deeper way and in a passionate way because I had a friend that I met at one of Tim's parties about 13 years ago who two years later 
had stage four pancreatic cancer, stage four lymphoma, given 15 days to live. I visit with him in hospice. He was given 15 days to live. He got his doctor to inject CBDs into his pancreas. I believe he just raised a couple million dollars. 14 years later, he has his own uh, cannabis brand. He was actually here in the audience last year. Another friend of ours had, his daughter actually had um, uh, pancreas, not uh, cervical cancer, twice surgically removed, came back a third time, injected CBD, never came back. I became a believer at that time. So I started thinking, okay, what is it? How does this stuff actually get into the mainstream? Well, you need research. You need third party university validation. And you need to be able to perform these, this upside over and over again. And I'm speaking in my movie producer, social impact movie producer lexicon, not technical or scientific because I'm neither technical nor scientific nor a lot of other things. And um, so I came up with this idea of matching strains to maladies. And again, it was on one of my, pal my panels that this woman, Dr. Katherine Jacobson, some of you know her, she actually developed through her postdoc work at Stanford a cure for her own child that was having 100 epileptic seizures a day. And after she succeeded, he w his child was having three seizures a month. And, and she received the first patent, I think about nine months ago. So on this panel, she raised her hand and said, well, because CBD and because cannabinoids are in our receptors, are already in our bodies, and because it's operating at a genetic level, one cure does not fit one all. It's genetic disposition, really like the way most medicine is. So you can't really do what I understand in my layman perspective the FDA is used to. And I say the word FDA gingerly because there are people on our panel, one in particular, Dr. John Powers, that happens to live in Maryland, very close to the FDA, and has a long history with his associates and his company, RX Remedies, to be working hand-in-hand in hand with the FDA and other folks to smoothly and harmoniously transition in the kind of regulations that we need so you're no longer having jet fuel or other forms of non-human uh, friendly ethanol being used to cut your CBDs in order to make people a lot of profits. Anyway, I'm not going to go much further uh, other than to go into the next mode because I want to get to the conversation as quickly as I can. Um, I am often asked to give my one uh, joke that I created, which is my feedback joke. Can I give you guys some feedback? You're a very good looking crowd, but that's typical for Los Angeles. Even though none of you are, it's the atmosphere minus the smoke. That joke was for Marty Perlman. Are you still in the room? Marty left. I won't do the other form of feedback, which is... That's what he wanted me to do, but I won't do that. Okay. I begin with my first guest today. Krishnan, please introduce yourself. Thank you. That was the beginning of my first applause, unless there was a mosquito there. Krishnan, please introduce yourself. I tend to blow things up, so I would rather the, hum the humble genes take over. And these men are all humble, and I know that personally. Hey guys, um, Krishnan Barrier. I am with Arcadian Capital Management. For those of you who are expecting my business partner, Matt Norgren, to be here, sorry to disappoint, he's not here, uh, so I'm, in, I'm here in his stead. We are a uh, LA-based, cannabis-focused VC fund um, that has a focus in investing in non-plant touching or ancillary cannabis companies. Um, and I, I would say that there was a period of doubt during 2019, probably earlier on, that you know we were missing out on some of the uh, plant touching opportunities. But as the years progressed and valuations have reset across the board, uh, we feel really fortunate to be in the position that we're in because our portfolio of companies is very strong, and uh, and we look forward to seeing how consolidation down the road continues to occur. Um, we're one of the more active names in uh, the cannabis industry with over 25 portfolio companies. We're also in the process of raising our second fund. Um, so if you, have a, uh, if you have a startup that has a couple of years of revenue, come talk to me because uh, we would be interested in, in uh, investing possibly. So your portfolio did not lose two thirds of its value uh, because none of your companies went public on the Canadian market. No, none of our. No, we, we've got a. We've got two or three public companies, but for the most part, our companies have remained private. Um, and as a result, 
the you know the there is no public valuation to speak of, but at the same time, uh, the valuations that we entered in at were relatively modest uh, from a from a uh, fundamental multiple standpoint. And you know, just to reinforce the didactic, and by the way, I have a master's in education, so I'm always interested in in those cognitive neurons being reinforced. You probably like companies that say to you, we want to build a company to be sustainable, to grow through M&A, not we want to exit three to five years, right? Look, our focus is actually to, uh, to help companies grow. So we're not investing in you know, pre-revenue companies, generally not seed stage. So Series A, or at least companies that have one or two years of revenue, we're really looking, in, looking to come in, bring our network um, and expertise to help companies scale up. So what we're looking for is a sales process, uh, a product, um, and a business that is scalable, but just needs the capital um, and, and access to expand their market footprint. Um, and that's, you know, that's what we bring. And just one last comment. I was on the phone yesterday with one of the largest wealth funds and they're giddy about their new philosophy as a venture and wealth fund actually helping the entrepreneurs besides just sitting on the board and giving some advice for 20 minutes. I assume that you guys are more entrepreneurs in that sense. Uh, hands on a little bit. So we, we're, we are hands on in the sense that we're, you know, we do everything we can to help our companies grow. Um, a lot of that, a lot of times it's making connections with potential customers. Uh, so being that our companies are largely non-plant touching ancillary companies, you know, the, the cross section of the types of businesses that we're investing in are largely tech. Um, we do have a few non-tech kind of IP related <laughs> co companies as well. One of them was actually supposed to be on the panel, Cameron, uh, with Kelsey Bio, but I'm not sure where he went, so I'll text him after this and figure that out. But, um, but Kelsey Bio is a, a great example of, a, um, of taking intellectual property and out licensing it to create a brand. And I will channel Cameron, minus the fact that I'm not a Native American uh, of the leadership class. Uh, his, his, his nation was 50,000 strong in Northern California through Oregon. Today it's about 500 because they all received blankets with smallpox. And so he committed his life to taking and, uh, antidotes for various uh, diseases, got a license on anthrax antidote and converted that into a CBD delivery company <coughs> and is doing quite well and, and I know that uh, Krishnan and his company are one of their very fervent uh, supporters. Speaking of fervent and speaking to the rich, rich part of the world where so much intellect and formerly British high-end education come from, let me talk, introduce you, son. Uh, you are also very much in this space uh, in terms of accelerating the capacity for high-quality product to be grown and, uh, and, and, and tweaked uh, on, on minute levels with measurement and particularly artificial sunlight that actually mimics the actual sun. Please introduce yourself and tell us what you're up to these days. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you uh, very much for having me back. Um, I will just start out with the word love. Um, we in our company center around love and our f most important is love for the plant, and then love for the patient, and then love to make a lot of money so we can do more plants to serve more patients. So if you do it that way, you understand that outdoor growing is the best way to do it. Absolutely the best way to grow. It. It. <laughs> and you can do it in, in living soil, no miracle Grow, no any of those kinds of products. And with Tim and the group around the Emerald Triangle, the way they've been doing it for years is the best cannabis. However, we've been getting into a significant amount of challenges with climate change, with the fact that hemp is now uh, allowed in California. We don't know what that's going to do to a lot of the outdoor grows because obvious reasons. And well, explain those reasons, please. 
Well, basically, you don't want contamination between the two. They get very excited. <laughs> What's the danger of that parallel crop being introduced? Well, it's going to uh, in, not in, basically infect, but it's going to propagate into your cannabis. It's basically going to create issues. Uh, so you're talking about feminizing, crossbreeding? Crossbreeding, feminizing, all of those things. So you don't know at what point in time, and it's, uh, it's very invisible, right? You don't know when it happens. I mean, you only know after it happens. You can't really, it's very hard to prevent because it's going through the air. So our goal at our company, we're a, a wellness, sustainability, and emerging technologies company. Uh, my background is I'm a plasma physicist along with a mechanical engineer, and I I've got my my MBA as well. But that's just the education part of it. The other part of it is I started doing cannabis in Berkeley when I was 16. Uh, and it, if, if I didn't do any of that, I probably wouldn't get the degrees that I've had. Uh, so I quite enjoy it to this day uh, for, for many things. I had rheumatoid arthritis and uh, I've been able to get off that. I'm vegan and gluten-free. But I'm an old guy, so I have to, I have to be able to live uh, a little bit longer. So anyway, we take biomimicry and create situations where we're not, we're being regenerative, we're not being resistive. And most of what's going on in, in, in the California market specifically, we know that 80% of cannabis is grown indoors, of legal cannabis, right? Uh, so what happens then is you're, you're really creating something that's not good for the plant. Um, and so what we do... Why is that, please? Well, because you're only growing in 21% of the sunlight. And everybody knows 21% to 23% of sunlight. And that's if you're using a high-pressure <laughs> sodium or an LED. The sunlight, you need everything from infrared all the way up to, uh, to UV. And if you don't have that, you're not stressing your plant. So what happens outdoors, it sets the immune system. It allows you to get full expression. So we developed a technology that's fusion, that's 50% uh, more efficient than LEDs, and covers 100 square feet, now 144 square feet, this newest generation, with one 1,000 watt light. So we can replace buildings that are 25 to 50,000 uh, watts of power, depending by just a few lights. So our goal really isn't to sell lights. Our goal is to get more, more medicinal plant out. So it takes living soil, and if Jeff Lowenfels were here, who's on our board, he'd be talking about living soil. And now you can do living soil indoors without any of those inputs and be able to grow Nigerian, here, we've done Molokai frost, and since we can adjust the sun to any latitude and longitude, we can grow whatever grows there by looking. We obviously can't do the terroir, but we can definitely do the soil and do the amendments and bring that in. For outdoor growers, we help them overwinter. We, we help them do their R&D and their genetics. We always like land races. And the major problem has been is you haven't been able to grow land races here, uh, and now you can do that. So at least you can do that, cross over once, come back if you want something really unique, but at least you've got those genetics. So someone, I'm going to nip it just a teeny bit, sure. but before you leave for now, uh, explain to me or explain to us how explicitly having this capacity impacts the quality to deliver certified organic, medicinal quality product. What's the relationship between strains and maladies and lighting? Wow. Well, when you have Mother Nature that's created these genetics of the land races, the 120 of them around the world, that is not a go bro, what I call a grow bro, right? You listen to your bro or a, what I call a Google grow. You know, you go up and look up what your friend's doing next doors. This is something that nature has developed for a significant amount of years. So I think by doing land races, you have genetics that have been 
been in service and being used. The former panel was talking about India, where I'm from. Uh, this has been being used as medicine for a lot of maladies, for years and years. So coming up with a, a cake or a kush, all these were just done because you were forced into a, doing it because you didn't have the sun available. So you were making other inputs to make up for 75% of the energy that plant is looking for. And the plant has more genetics than we do. More genetics than we do. And in fact, it's a beautiful lady that wraps the grower around their little finger. It starts turning different colors. You run and you try to do something. You think you're a master grower? No. That plant is doing it for you. It's more amazing. So the reason why sunlight is significantly important is because it is the energy source. Without sunlight, we would not be here. Think of your microbiome. 70% of your immune system in your human body is there. We need vitamin D. We need to be in sunlight. It's the same thing with the plant. The okay. microbiome is the soil. If you do all kinds of other additives, you know, 80% of what's in a lot of these shows, they're mitigating the fact that they're not okay. in sunlight. And so there what they do... The sun. do, do, do. Sorry. That, I just wanted to stop because we only have 25 sure. minutes left. Absolutely. Uh, and everybody could do this except for me. Yeah. Uh, I still spell pot with two T's. So uh, on that note, Tim Blake, please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Tim Blake. I started the Emerald Cup 16 years ago. Uh, I've been in the cannabis industry uh, for 47 years. So I've watched all the decades go through. Uh, Emerald Cup's always been organic. Um, I, uh, I, uh, that's just, it was, you gotta be, okay, go. That's funny. I try to match David's humor. Uh, so uh, about uh, 12 years ago, I came down with some serious illnesses from working in the cannabis industry and the indoors and stuff. I got three types of mold, Sportigatus, Candida, and black mold at levels that would kill you. Uh, tested, blood tested, and it ruined my immune system. So I then had to uh, go through a series. I started working with the best healers on the West Coast and learned a lot about healing. Uh, but it wrecked my immune system. I ended up getting uh, major rounds, three rounds of cancer, uh, learning this. Uh, I healed that with black salve, which is Native American uh, material, which we don't have to go into here. But I also used uh, the original Simpson oils. And so I really realized at that time what a tremendous healing nature cannabis could be. That was about 12 years ago. So I started studying all that. And, uh, you know, we talk about matching strains and whatnot. You know, I'm an old school guy. And, you know, you can do your indicas and your sativas. You know, the indicas are pain relief and <coughs> sleep and whatnot. And the sativas go for the, you know, for the energy, creativity, and the suppression of appetites and different things. But, and you can get Charlotte's Webb to do something for medicine, uh, for help and what, epilepsy and whatnot. But if you're really talking about medicine, it's, it is what he said, it's no longer strains for specific, it's really the combinations of cannabinoids. And with them coming out with uh, the knowledge of not just CBD, but C CBDA, THCA, you know, um, CBDN, all the variations, we were just talking with John here, the Israelis have a clinical trial going, 17 of them, and they've discovered 3119 and 3 BGO, which uh, one of those, I believe, was uh, uh, heals cancer. So the things we're coming on to very quickly now are these combinations of cannabinoids. I take a combination of CBDA, THCA, CBD, and THC every day. The rest of my life, I will. Uh, so you really want to find what the combination is now. Everybody's different, especially with cannabis. There is no set formula or no set strain that's going to work across the board. It doesn't work like that. You really have to find out what's going to work for you. But the important thing is, I've always been a proponent of organic farming, you know, just like organic food. You go to the farmer's markets, the quality energy, the food. But it's about whole plant extract. A lot of these medicinal companies are using CO2 or they're using distillates, so they're using uh, direct infusion. They're, they're taking apart the terpenes, they're tearing it down, and you know, the only way that you're really going to get true medicine is through whole plant extracts with, with alcohol and ethanol coming out and, uh, and really getting the whole plant in there. And uh, you got Rosette Wellness and you got Aunt Zelda's with Mara Gordon that are doing that. Uh, that's the only type of medicine that I myself, after these years, you know, people come to me uh, daily. Uh, I used to be the, the, the main stoner, the king of the Emerald Cup, get high. I don't get high that much anymore on a daily basis. I really spend almost all my time 
helping people heal. I've got one friend with throat cancer right now. I've got an uncle, Parkinson's. I mean, I, daily I, I tend to people. Uh, and so I study a lot and try to figure that out. And so it's, it's really about going back and, you know, even with Harry, my, my partner Rosette, you know, he's, he's explaining to me that it's about taking the cannabinoids on the same time of the day every day. It's about separating it into three times a day because it only lasts for seven, eight hours. So you've got to take it on, you know, multiple times a day. It's these little things that you learn about the healing that you need to find out. But they're going to now, I'm so excited because we're going to end up very soon, and I'm sure John will tell you, that we're going to end up with a customized formulation for everybody where they can put it in a pill, edibles, tinctures, whatever it is. And they can really, scientifically, they're going to be able to decide what's best for you. And they're going to be able to give you that formula. I mean, Harry Rose will tell you that it's a 30, 30, 30, 10, uh, 30 percent THC, 30 percent CBD, 30 percent CBD, and 10 percent THC as an overall general wellness blend, you know, and it's, it's going to be one of those that people want to take every day. Uh, you can definitely go smoke cannabis. You can, I recommend vaporizing it because I have COPD also, and I heal that through vaporizing cannabis. Uh, so, I, you know, vaporization is the only way to go. I don't think smoking, I, I'm not against it. People can do it, burn your lungs up. I did. Uh, but it's really those combinations, and that's what we need to get down to. So I'll let John speak. So let me uh, just do my little introduction here. It's actually an amazing pairing that we have these two folks, West Coast, East Coast, a, uh, an artisan grower who had the genius to have, figure out how to have the 200 best strains or whatever the number was in one room and figure out how to get the judges to be able to judge them without all going unconscious. 13 years ago, I was at the first party, there were about 100 or so people there. Last, uh, next week, there'll be probably 25 to 30,000 at Tim's little party. Sitting next to Tim is the East Coast, former, I don't know, uh, you know exactly how fully to describe John other than button down, East Coast, FDA aligned, a, a, a doctor in, in multiple areas, a um, brilliant chemist and entrepreneur with a couple exits, the real deal. And uh, John can communicate what he's doing right now, but it's a very interesting, confluence that's happening at this table and in the industry today as the FDA and the DEA come together and separate the cheaters and those that are not ready to comply to the benefit of consumers into the next wave of pharmaceutical blessing from the last hundred thousand years. John Powers. Thank you. Um, Dr. John Powers, excuse me. I have to tell you, Dave asked me, we've been working on a business project together, Dave asked me to come out here and speak and I'm going to paraphrase a Marcho, Marco uh, Groucho Marx line that the hell would I want to come talk to a group that would have me as a speaker? That doesn't make any sense. So I told him no. And then he reminded me of the weather difference between LA and Baltimore, and I'm here. So uh, I'm actually president and CEO of a holding company. We have 10 verticals. We believe that uh, having verticals in multiple aspects of this industry is going to be critical because we have no idea which way this is going. One of those verticals is RX Remedies, it is a CBD manufacturer that makes pharmaceutical products. My background, I'm a, I did the MD-PhD program at University of Maryland. Uh, my background is oncology, and uh, then I went and got an MBA to realize what everything I'd been doing was wrong. So I, th I think the, um, the, the message that I want to share is that FDA is coming, and it is a game changer. Um, it is no different than any other drug that's out there. So somewhere between the historic growers like Tim and the pharmaceutical people like us is the reality of this plant. It is novel, it is different than anything else that's ever been out there. Uh, my wife's a professor of genetics at the University of Maryland and did Penn State. So uh, we, we joke about this is our last hurrah. We have been blessed to have been built and sold many biotech companies, but we looked at each other, we got six kids and seven grandchildren, and said, you know, when we were in med school, if you pissed positive, you were out. What a great opportunity now to show our grandkids, oh, this is a really cool stuff, right? So that's kind of how we got into this industry. There's, in my company, there's six PhDs, two MDs, and uh, we are a, a keenly pharmaceutically based company that is doing clinical trials in this arena. You could think of this, uh, the, any CBD, THC, any of them, as, as pseudo um, ibuprofens, right? So if you, if you take ibuprofen and 200 milligrams, you can go to CVS and buy it over the counter. Over the counter means you can self-diagnose and self-treat without any serious adverse effects. SAEs is what the FDA calls that. And that means someone died. That's a nice acronym for somebody died on the medication. We have no deaths with THC or CBD. There's zero. It's an astounding 
compound that we're just beginning to understand. But ibuprofen, if you take it in 200 milligrams, is an over-the-counter product. You take it in 800 milligrams, it's a prescription product, right? So this, we think, is where this CBD, THC, all the combinations of all the cannabinoids and all the terpenes is heading. You'll have a recreational use, which this guy gets to judge, and I'm really jealous. Then you'll have a, a over-the-counter use of a certain concentrations, and then you'll have a prescription, and I'm convinced that the prescription, and this is why we seriously got into it, the CBD-THC combinations of, for um, um, symptomatic relief so is really You do think that there will be the equivalent of nutraceuticals over the counter? No. Because it seems like that's on the way out. No, the FDA has expressly said that that's not the case, so, um, but, but it is no So what do you mean by over the counter if it's not considered nutraceutical? Um, I'll get into that in one second, if I may. But so what I wanted to tell you, though, is the recreational component might be like you can make beer or wine at home. Right? You can do that today, legally. And, and that might be where we're heading with this class of compounds. What, what's important to understand is there's so many. Tim was mentioning that you need the whole plant medicine. The issue there is that is the antithesis of what the FDA likes for, 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 for uh, pancreatic cancer, you know, we have gemcitabine. It was one chemical that we studied, I was part of that clinical trial group, that said this is the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the API that he was referring to. That's what gets you home. When you have two, now I have to do a 2x trial, right? When you get to the hundreds, it's impossible. Absolutely impossible. So what, what happens in botanical medicine, and it's no different, malaria treatments came from this, um, aspirin is a chem chemical called acetyl salicylic acid, right? It, they noticed, and I'm paraphrasing here, but natives were chewing on the bark of a tree back in the 1900s. And well, what the hell's in the tree? Well, they synthesized that compound, found out it was an analgesic, and now we make it as an API, acetyl salicylic acid and aspirin. That's how it comes about. This is no different. So this is nothing new to the pharmaceutical industry that the horse is out of the barn before we ever got a hold of it is what's new. That's the critical piece. If I went to the FDA and said, ah, I want you to approve gemcitabine for pancreatic cancer, and they said no, he ain't gonna know, he ain't gonna care. No one would know. If I said put THC back in the barn, <laughs> good luck, right? So that's where we are. We are a um, our companies are a OTC and script, and that's where I'll come back to this. Um, but we, we have to recognize, and I'm not being pejorative, but we started as a stoner industry. I mean, that's really what we started as. And there's room for everybody in this because, again, it's, it's a drug that you can't put back in the barn, but we're taking a purely pharmaceutical approach. And if you think Merck and Pfizer and Monsanto aren't in this too, I mean, they're, they're all there. Because of our federal handcuffs, we're not allowed to do the trials and the clinical work that we would like to, but it is being done overseas. We, we're actually doing animal studies overseas ourselves, and it, it'll come full circle. We believe that the FDA will be in this within a couple of years. So that's the difference between if you go buy the drug at CVS or if you go buy it as a prescription or if you make and sell it for yourself at home. I want to actually come back quickly. John began the second move. Okay, go ahead, Tim. Uh, well, uh, and through my uh, healing uh, discovery and research, you know, I agree with John that that's the way the FDA is going to want it. They're going to want to single isolate those cells or those cannabinoids. But uh, Harry Rose, who was Steve Jobs' right arm for all the productions he did, 250 employees, he got stage four uh, autoimmune. They gave up his, uh, they gave up hope on him. And he's the one who went and found Ringo Lawrence, who was actually the one who discovered the original Charlotte Webb strain, uh, Sour Tsunami, Ringo's Gift, all the CBD strains, the major strains came through Ringo. Uh, Harry went and found him, and they spent 15 years ago the time developing those strains to heal Harry. And Harry healed himself of that stage four disease and then spent his last 15 years dedicating to getting standardized SOPs for his farm so it all comes out right, standardized extraction techniques. He developed those genetics. He developed 10,000 case studies, which the Israelis now say he has the largest body of work of any in the world. He can tell you exactly which formulations of each of those cannabinoids will work for different diseases. Okay, and he is a very strong advocate that single cell or single cannabinoid isolates may be fine for certain diseases or illnesses, but it's the whole plant extract of putting those together. You need to have the THC and the CBD and the combinations. It's, it's the entourage effect of those coming together that equals something more. 
And because of Harry's research and what, uh, what I've seen him do, he was on the phone with the lead Israelis doing the 17 clinical trials. And I can tell you, I was on the phone with him after 30 minutes. They were saying that he was the finest medicinal person, the most brilliant person they ever seen in the world. He was supposed to be here today, but he's busy making our products and getting ready to launch at the Cup. The Cup has gone from one flowers contest to 27 different contests. We do all the CBD side of the contest too. But I'll tell you, it's very difficult to judge. Because when you get these people together to judge CBD or the different elements of it, they all get different effects and it doesn't happen immediately. It's over a long term period. So it's actually very difficult to judge the CBD side of it. Uh, the recreational side will have you come in, John. <laughs> we appreciate one last comment. Tim didn't can, tell you this, but. Can I address that for one second? Go ahead, please. Uh, let, let me be uh, two things I want to say. Um, that the FDA is in a real pickle here. Uh, uh, so I want to go on record as saying that, 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 that I'm not advocating a single use drug. We are absolute advocates of multiple, but we have to know what they are and we have to know how they work together and we have to do trials on that. The FDA's pickle is that clinical trials always go animal studies, phase one for safety, phase two for efficacy, phase three for safety and efficacy, right? That's the traditional model that's worked very, very well. The issue here is if I tell you you have to take two or three years and do a safety study for THC or CBD, what are you talking about? There's hundreds of thousands of users every day. Now that's anecdotal, it's not scientifically reproducible, but it's very compelling data. Now if I tell you effectivity, right, that's the next phase, well those same hundred thousand use it tomorrow. Yeah, they're not all idiots, something's working, right? So we have a safety and efficacy that are four to six years in the average model that the FDA is going to have to figure out how to handle. Now we propose that we'll go from animal studies to get the base science right directly to trials with humans uh, comparing, for example, opiates or anxiolytics or things like that. So that's the first thing I wanted to share. And second, most important, I want to be the only killjoy. CBD does not cure cancer. Right? If the FDA is watching, we never said it, okay? The reason we can't say it is you cannot make a medical claim without the clinical data to back it up. There's anecdotal data to suggest that this is a very compelling drug to study. There's a lot of people that, and I will say off the record, that we help in this arena as well. But we cannot make those claims, and that's the FDA's major issue with all of us, that we make medical claims that are unfounded. That's the problem that we face. So we got a race to get this through, to use people like uh, Ringo Lawrence, who yeah. I definitely want to meet, yeah. and, and bring this all together. So you know, thank that, you. Yeah. I understand that that makes real sense and stuff on one note, but in the case of Harry, is the, the Israelis are actually doing 17 clinical trials, and they're the ones that said they <coughs> thought they found the compounds, which you're aware of, 3119 and whatnot. Um, I didn't make that if anybody saw that. Um, and so the other side of that is that Harry, like they said, he's already done 2,000 PET studies and 10,000 clinical studies with, with patients, all done and with SOPs that would be standardized. So like the Israelis said, he's already years ahead of them. And he's already got it all built into what heals. So if you go on and look up Rosette Wellness, you'll see who Harry Rose is and what he's doing. And you, and you should meet him because he's really the most brilliant researcher and, de and developer in the world of this. But I understand the way the FDA works, but do we want to wait six years and go through pets and through all that? Or do we want to go back to somebody like Harry Rose who's already done it, get their formulations and start saving our children and our kids and everybody else? I mean, I understand where John's coming from because it has to be done that way too. There's two sides to that. And I, I recognize both. So three quick comments, because we've only got a few minutes left. I actually had a, a vision because of the capacity of AI and data capture. Why not get 100,000 people to get an upside by reporting their ongoing experience? Far bigger than any trial. I mean, there may be a way to harness some of that data. And speaking of anecdotal data, I've seen Tim's bone before in his leg because he had cancer <laughs> right down to his leg. And Tim does not go to doctors or hospitals. He cured himself with cannabis and other natural medicines. He shouldn't be here today. His immune system is completely compromised. He shouldn't be here today, but he's looking pretty good. Known him a long time. Uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, Sun and Krishnan, I want you both just to, I know you have a comment, Sun. Uh, Sun. Just give me your trend just a little bit. Yeah, please. Try to keep it to a minute or two. You as well, Krishnan, because I wanna get it open up to the audience. A third of you who could be on the panel yourself, and then you're gonna be my first question because you made the mistake of raising your hand to stretch. So I will ask you a question, so prepare it. Son, go ahead. So uh, I, I guess I want to do, yes, absolutely, I'll answer that. I think we, we cannot take, uh, we have to take cannabis into the corporate world, not put the corporate world into cannabis. Uh, the reason I'm vegan and gluten-free is, look at big ag. I mean, seriously, are we going to follow that? 
Um, and if the FDA, I mean, Harry Rose and Rosette, by the way, Harry was supposed to be here, but he's so busy helping people heal that he couldn't make this meeting. I talked to him this morning. That plant in full plant extract has already engineered it. For us to do extraction and become pharmacists is extremely, it's like eating the seed of an avocado and saying, oh my goodness, and, and throwing the rest away as though we can somehow do that. I, I just think that we have to, the people who have core values and understand this plant, why do you think the underground market is significantly large? Because they're helping people, not because the money is there. In fact, some of their product is actually cleaner than what's legal, especially with 25% mold that's allowed by California standards and testing. Okay. Sorry, I'll go to my trends. Okay. Okay. Do your trends really fast. Okay. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. So the trend, I think, is that the trends I'm seeing that are bad is the CBD without THC. And on topical, that's great. It's like you can, you know, I can clean my window with it. Uh, I don't know what else I can do. I can put it in my car and drive it. Um, so CBD, CBD, CBD is making all that problem. That's a big issue. And, and Tim will, will argue that without a certain amount of THC, that the CBDs are not fully triggered. Exactly. It I, isn't. I, maybe not. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And then the second trend, I think, is people mitigating and not using, and obviously I'm involved in that, is creating the whole atmosphere for that plant as though it's outdoors, if you're going to do it indoors. Otherwise, please do it very well outdoors. That's the best plant. Okay. Krishnan? So, one of the trends that we're seeing in terms of, uh, in terms of the types of companies that are pitching to us that fits within, uh, fits within the, the uh, whole plant extract kind of ethos, but also um, with taking drugs through the clinical trial process is the proliferation of companies that are trying to develop uh, biosynthetic cannabinoids. Um, or you know chemically synthetic cannabinoids, and so when you, you know your uh, the FDA process as it is today requires that you only take one compound at a time uh, through a clinical trial process, and then you know if you've got one compound that gets approved, such as CBD, um, that uh, that is the active pharmaceutical agreement ingredient for Epidiolex, um or THC, I don't think there are any specific yeah, no. drugs out there that have THC <coughs> as a compound, but you're gonna have, you know, there's also a number of other compounds as well, um, THCB, THCA, C CBG, things like that, that aren't found um, naturally yeah, in yeah. as high of concentrations. Um, and so these companies that are using mostly yeast-based, uh, processes to uh, to develop uh, um, these cannabinoids synthetically is going to be a, I, I think whoever figures it out and who's ever able to scale it up um, is going to find the holy grail in particularly as it as it relates to taking drugs through the FDA clinical what trial process or synthetic cannabinoids? what's going to happen it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, but, but think about th think about. But it's that. not going to replace cannabis. But but think about what we do with uh, even aspirin. Uh, we take we take a synthetic no. aspirin. No. We add caffeine to it, a botanical extract, and we call it Excedrin migraine. Right. So th there'll always be extracts that you use and combinations of terpenes, botanicals, and and so it, it's coming. It'll happen, but it won't take over. I still I combine, still I combine the aspirin with cannabis. I still use the old-fashioned willow bark aspirin. I don't use any of that stuff. And uh, you can use pure CBD for things like anxiety. The, the vets uh, have, uh, they were doing one suicide uh, a month, and they haven't had one in three years, but they're doing massive amounts of CBD, like 500,000 milligrams a day, uh, unbelievable amounts. Uh, but they're finding that it gets rid of all that anxiety. Now, there's no THC in that, and, and for some uh, epileptic uh, issues and stuff, you know, it's definitely it's just CBD. But for most illnesses, you need the entourage effect. You need that whole plant combination of, of cannabinoids that really bring the healing together. And I'm just an old-fashioned guy who just looks at it like, that's just simple. We don't need to go play Frankenstein with Mother Nature. You want to finish? Yeah, and so in terms of 
In terms of isolating compounds versus a whole plant extract, I think there's a place in this universe for, for everyone. Uh, and because there's a lot of, because isolated, these compounds do provide specific benefits. Is it gonna provide the same benefit as, as consuming a whole plant? No. 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 Absolutely not. No. More the FDA model. That's actually interesting. But they do have value in, in and of themselves, and, uh, and I, I think it's important that we continue to, to, uh, well, to research that. You can get CBG, CB, uh, and CBC from, nor and, and from northern India, from uh, and central hemp. You can get it CBL from Afghani, from Pakistan. Land races, you can get THCV in Africa. So I, I don't think it's that, it's just getting to scale. So what we're doing is treating the symptom rather than the cause and making these other synthetics. I'm My getting, opinion. that person's not stretching, they don't have arthritis, they tell me to wrap up. Lady in so, the back. Yep, exactly. They, they were talking about my intellect. So a couple quick announcements, uh, and then maybe one question. Yes, you'll get it, one second. Uh, Sean asked me to, to advocate his medicine or poison how do you know your children or your cannabis? Two o'clock tomorrow here, because they moved it. Number two, we're all gonna have to get out of here in about two minutes, because they have to set up lunch. Then you can come back at 12.30. Also, just FYI, my biotech company is about accelerating the capacity for CBDs and other medicines to go directly to the brain instead of through the bloodstream. Um, one question. Maybe two, if we're lucky. Go ahead, fast. Go fast. So obligation to educate social impact and tips. Uh, Quick. Ever since I've been there with the Animal Cup, that's our whole motto. Teach people to live organically, grow organically, and uh, to heal and inspire themselves through natural living. Uh, we do a lot of education. Education is the whole thing. That's why I'm here. That's why we're all here. Education across this country and across the world is the most important facet of cannabis so that we can all work together to really improve our health and uh, for our families, our pets, and everybody. Uh, as far as the event thing, we're having a panel of State of Cannabis on Friday that I'm moderating. The event thing was overlooked by the B BCC, same with tourism. Uh, we had to fight the BCC for nine months to even get on their schedules. They just didn't okay. understand it. And it's been very challenging, but we're really pushing hard so that all the events, farmers, markets, and everybody else can okay. have access because we need it. And this is a new kind of industry. I'd say more than two thirds of the people have social impact. This is a social life crowd. There was one last question standing. Last one, go fast. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take anything unless you know it's Providence where it's from. No, uh, CB, come on up, I'll talk, I'll talk to you about that afterwards. Go ahead, John. Or ask John afterwards. Or just give him 10 seconds, John. No, no. Go ahead. You're allergic to CBD? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that it's not the CBD you're allergic to as a chemical. I'm going to suggest it's the carrier, whether they use a coconut oil, MCT, depending on what they yeah. use. We can talk about that if you wish. Yeah. Thank you very much. Get out and then come back in.